Hi everyone, thank you for coming to uh, today's Smart Grid Seminar. Our speaker today is Professor Saed Ali Samir from Yale University. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, let's uh, talk about some of the uh, basic features that you can use with this, uh, for this Zoom meeting. Uh, so first of all, everyone will be muted upon entry to reduce background noise but you can unmute yourself uh, at the end of, of the uh, presentation in the Q&A section, uh, if you have any questions. So, and there are three features that I would like to, you to pay attention to. The first one is this chat feature. You can use that to communicate with us if you have any technical uh, difficulties. So for example, you cannot see the slides, you can tell us, or you cannot hear the speaker. The second feature is raise hand. If you have a clarification question, you can use that feature. So let's say you uh, would like a definition to be clarified during the presentation, you can use this. And finally, there is this Q&A feature that you can use to ask uh, in-depth questions. So these questions will be addressed and answered at the end of the presentation. And if you have follow-up questions, you can unmute yourself. Um, to ask your follow-up questions. Uh, just want to remind everyone, uh, our next seminar is next week on the 19th. Uh, Professor Su from Columbia University will uh, give a presentation. Uh, Professor Zaher Ali Samir is an Associate Professor of Operations Management with the Yale School of Management. Uh, he received his PhD in business, uh, business administration, decision science from Duke University. His research interest lies in the area of social responsibility and sustainability, as well as healthcare, uh, especially on policy, public policy related problems that involve dynamic decision making and learning. Uh, he has worked on government subsidy instruments in the renewable energy industry and agriculture. Uh, today, he is going to talk about the role of smart appliances in electricity pricing. Uh, Professor, I will let you share your slides. Is my slides visible now? Can everybody see my slides now? It is, and it doesn't look like you're in presentation mode. Okay, that I can, I think that I can fix. Okay, how about now? That didn't change it. <laughs> oh. Is it good now? We can we can still see it. It's a, I, see. I see a sidebar, but that's not a problem. Oh, because on my screen is actually full screen, but <laughs> maybe we can still proceed with this. Is it visible? If it's visible, I think we should be fine. It is visible. I have a note from someone who says if you stop sharing and start sharing again. Then. Okay, that, okay, we can do that. Ah, that's better. Wonderful. Okay. Margo. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks, uh, Chinwu and Wahila, for the introduction and for organizing this talk. It's a pleasure to present in this seminar series. I hope you are enjoying your beautiful sunny afternoon in Palo Alto, which I was supposed to enjoy, by the way, but if it wasn't for this pandemic. So, in any case, I'm coming to you from a very rainy and gloomy day in from Yale campus in New Haven. And Thanks for the invitation. It's very exciting to actually see that you have this seminar series with a special focus on smart grid, given that this is such an interdisciplinary topic and it attracts attention from various fields. So hopefully today I'm gonna to contribute to this discussion and um, more from an operations management perspective from a more like an economic point of view, and especially which more focus on the details of consumer decision-making process and uh, as you will see, the talk, the talk is slightly technical, but I will try to use my limited time to mostly convey the main message and try to 
uh, spend less time on, on the technical details, but hopefully it will, I mean, uh, I can still make the, uh, leave you with the main takeaways. And uh, I have to say, even though I have been teaching on Zoom for a couple of semesters, I'm not still an expert on it. So I can see your names. And if you have any question, please feel free to stop me, raise your hand, I will see that. And uh, I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to answer your questions. Otherwise, at the end, we also can have a live uh, Q&A uh, after, after I'm done. Okay, so this is a, a joint work with uh, my colleague from University of Texas at Dallas, Xu Chuang Wang, and also one of our PhD students, uh, Fariba Farajbat. And we started working on this topic a couple of years ago when we heard about the recent changes which is happening in, uh, in electricity markets. As all of you are probably aware, uh, most of the electricity markets around the world are undergoing significant changes, uh, partly due to the fact that automation and smart technologies are becoming an integral part of, of power grids. And this technological empowerment, together with the rapid expansion of electricity markets, which, for example, in the US reached close to half a trillion dollars in revenue in 2016, has led to some very heated policy debates about how this smart technologies can lead to some solution for enhancing efficiency and resili the resiliency of our uh, power system. So um, there are so certain features of electricity market which makes them different from other commodity markets. I mean, as all of you probably are aware, so one distinct, distinctive feature of electricity market is that we usually face fluctuating demand, fluctuating demand which is very hard to predict in advance and where it only realizes very, very close to the consumption point, with the emergence of renewable energy, which introduces supply intermittency, that this problem is only magnified because we also have a lot of variability in the amount of renewable energy that we can generate in the electricity grid. And up to now, there are very limited or scarce economically viable storage capabilities, unlike other commodities which can be stored. That is not the case for electricity, at least as of now, battery or storage solutions are still very, very, very expensive. And at the same time, we cannot afford to allow for supply, for allow for demand exceeding supply because that may lead to some brownout or blackouts that has significant economic and financial losses and have very negative consequences. So this introduces this big challenge which electrical system face, which is the supply demand mismatch. And the idea is, okay, what are the best things we can do and how we can use these smart technologies to mitigate the supply demand mismatch. So in this graph, you can see electricity consumption in Spain, for example, over a span of seven years. And you can see that there are some seasonal, seasonality patterns, but even if it allow for seasonality, there is still a lot of fluctuation compared to a baseline that we expect, as you can see, in terms of thousands of megawatt hours, there is still a lot of fluctuation up and down with respect to that baseline, which is represented by, by zero on the, on the left, left axis. Okay, so what are we doing to, this, to address this problem? Well, these are smart technologies such as a smart grid, which allows utility firms to monitor uh, consumption in real time, has empowered them to experiment with various forms of the so-called demand response program. So I'm sure all of you are, are, are familiar with what demand response programs are. Majority, of, so while some a small portion of them are focused on direct load control and cartel man management based on some a specified contractual agreement, majority of them are price-based demand response programs. So these kind of a price-based incentive mechanisms have received tremendous popularity and research has shown that they can increase, lead to significant increase in the efficiency of the power grid if, if designed and implemented uh, well. So, but the recent implementation of these kind of price-based demand response programs have generated some mixed results. So why is that? First of all, the prevailing assumption in design price-based demand response programs is that consumers are sensitive to price signals for electricity, and they are fully aware of their consumption at any point in time, and they fine-tune their consumption decision as they receive price signals. So that's the underlying idea. Basically, it, it, it possesses, possesses that they know exactly how their demand is going to unfold in the future after price signals are observed or after prices are set. And then they informatively adjust their consumption decision up or down as they receive price signals. So, but as I said, the recent implementation of 
uh, demand response program have generated mixed results and basically these results which is kind of against the expected uh, outcomes that we uh, that the the, the, the uh, uh, developers of these price mechanisms had in mind has undermined the validity of this assumption that indeed consumers are sensitive to this price signal so what are, what is the main challenge the main challenge is that well even after prices are set and even after consumers observe the price they still face some uncertainty in terms of their demand and in terms of the amount of electricity that they consume and if you assume that these demand response programs work perfectly it implies that the consumers should constantly monitor their consumption after they observe the price and then they react to incorporate that into their decision making and they optimize or readjust their consumption decision accordingly, which is obviously not the case. So what are these kind of fluctuations? Well, there can be, there can be many different sources, but probably the most obvious one, which, is, uh, which has a big impact on our consumption decision, especially at the residential level, is variation in the ambient environment, in particular weather or temperature changes. So this is the same graph that I showed you in the previous slides for, for electric electricity consumption in Spain. And then at the bottom, the blue line represents the temperature, which obviously has a very obvious uh, cyclical pattern. And as you can see, when the outdoor temperature is too high or too low, we, we observe a peak in electricity consumption. So temperature plays a big role, obviously, in the amount of electricity consumption. And many of these temperature changes happen unexpectedly, or there are some fluctuations that cannot be predicted accurately. And as you can see on the right, uh, According to EIA uh, energy outlook, air conditioning actually makes a big part of electricity consumption for an average household, close to 20% on average. And on a hot summer day or on a very cold day in winter, different, depending on which region you live in, it can actually increase to 60% of your electricity consumption. So that's only air conditioning. But there are some other uh, consumers of electricity, which again, also have to do with weather, like refrigeration or water heating, space heating, as you can see in this graph. So those all essentially have to do with, uh, have to do with uh, temperature and outdoor condition. And according to a recent study by a prominent uh, energy economists, actually they concluded that 20% of our electricity consumption can be, uh, can be saved if we only readjust our AC temperature by only four degrees during the very hot summer days. And that would have prevented some of the blackouts that we observed in California over the last summer, which probably some of you had experienced. So, but why do we have this lack of response from the consumers in terms of responding to these changes in the ambient, in the ambient environment? Well, this has been attributed to the limited cognitive ability and the attention that consumers pay to the to what happens in their in 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 in, in their in their outside um, outside as I said in the ambient environment. So as Ernest Bornstein put it, as probably some of you know him, he's a prominent energy economist at Berkeley. He says in reality consumers make such, which refers to electricity consumption decisions, with limited information, attention, and cognitive ability. So that is something that the developers of this price-based incentive program or demand response programs, that is what they essentially miss. That is what they don't take into account. So the idea of this talk, and for this talk, I mainly focus on just temperature and, and air conditioning, but it can be essentially extended to other settings as well. So the idea here is to incorporate informational and cognitive limitations of consumers, and then see how it can, incorpor how it can be incorporated into uh, having a better understanding of the consumption patterns faced by utility firms. So maybe for many of us, we don't really adjust our air conditioning that much because maybe it, it's not a big part of our electricity bill or maybe for you guys who are living in California, there are not that much fluctuation in outdoor temperature. But here I, I have three examples from three different apartments in New York City from some of the less affluent neighborhoods. And as you can see, Indeed, the indoor temperature has some patterns, which is the red line. And then you can see that the blue line is the outdoor temperature. So and some of you may say, well, these, these variations, the red temperature, which represents the indoor temperature, it may be attributable to other things. For example, 
whether I'm at home or not, or whether I have a guest over, or, or whether I feel cold because I'm sick or others, of course, that can be part of these variations. But we, when we study this in more details, we see that there is actually some correlation between the outdoor and indoor temperature, meaning that for these less affluent co communities, they, they are really careful about how much electricity they consume. And when they, for example, may sometimes, if they see that the outside is very cold, maybe they lower their, uh, their uh, thermostat setting to save on electricity. So then the question is, to what extent that is the case? And when you look, when you look at it at an aggregate level, how can we incorporate that to, uh, to reach some meaningful conclusion for utility firms in terms of, in terms of estimating their demand? So, as I said, the idea is that consumers usually do not have sufficient cognitive cap capability or will incur extensive opportunity costs if they want to perfectly optimize or re-optimize their consumption decision over time in response to changes in their ambient environment. So what is our goal here? So for the purpose of this talk, given the limited time that we have, my goal is to just shed some light on this, as I said, with a special focus on the residential sector and air conditioning in particular. And uh, basically it improve to some extent, improve our understanding of how consumers make decision in light of these random demand shocks, which happens very close to consumption point, because utility firms, if they want to design meaningful and effective demand response programs, they need to know what to expect for a given price. So if price is set at a particular level, how we should expect consumers to react to it. And then they, that can be used as a building block. So that's exactly our goal here. That can be used as a building block to design better and more effective demand response programs. And then the other question is, okay, how these values sorry, how these changes with having more smarter homes or more smart appliances, how that changes and how that affects the utility firm's pricing decisions. So I don't expect to be able to get to all of this during this talk, but we'll see how, how far we can, we can proceed. So what we do here is basically we formalize the household decision-making process and provide a theoretical foundation for analyzing their limited capability in responding to uh, essentially random shocks in the external environment. So I'm going to skip the literature review by just saying that most of the existing papers in this area, they examine how the total consumption react to a change in unit price, but they generally overlook random factors such as, such as changes in, 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 in te outdoor temperature, for example. And they also don't take into account for households possible behavioral or cognitive barriers. So that's exactly what we are trying to achieve here. So as some of these papers, for example, this paper from Ernst Bornstein in 2009 or this paper by Ito in 2014 show empirically by studying some real data from households, uh, I believe from California, they argue that consumers are not capable of accurately inferring the marginal price that they face and they only react basically to average price. So that is exactly another uh, that confirmation of the fact that consumers in general are not perfect or perfectly rational decision makers. So they face some cognitive limitations and we have to take that into account when we want to predict how they make their decisions. So that is exactly our, the, our goal in this, in this research. We want to incorporate these behavior, behavioral aspects and see how it shapes the, the overall consumption that's faced by a typical utility company. Okay, so with that, let me go into the details of our model. So the model that we construct here consists of a utility firm and a population of households. For the sake of simplicity, we represent this population of households as a single representative consumer. So let's say we, have a, we are facing a population of thousands of households, but we want to capture their behavior as a single representative consumer. And uh, and then obviously this can be extended to situations where we have heterogeneous households, but for the purpose of this talk, just to keep things simple, I just assume that we have a single representative consumer which represents the entire population of households. So let's say price is set, if you have a flat rate price which is set at P, that is the price of unit price of electricity that this representative consumer faces, and then uh, we are facing some uh, so the consumer has to make some decision about 
her appliance setting, let's say, for example, what, what is going to be my thermostat setting, I represent that by X. So X is going to be my decision at any point in time. And at the same time, there is some external random shocks, let's say outdoor temperature, which is realized and I represent it by W. That W is a random variable at any point in time, let's say at any 10 minutes or 15 minutes, it, take, it can potentially take a different value. It, it's up to us to define what is our time unit. It can be an hour, it doesn't matter. So P is the price, X is the decision that I make, let's say my indoor temperature, my thermostat setting, and W is the random shock or the uh, outdoor temperature that I'm facing. So what is the consumption coming from, let's say my air conditioning? It has been shown empirically in the literature that the cons electricity consumption follows this quadratic pattern, meaning that as the distance between my indoor setting and outdoor temperature increases, in fact, the consumption, electricity consumption increases based, based on a quadratic fashion. So if X and W are very close to each other, obviously I have very little consumption. But as X and W deviate from each other in either direction, then my electricity consumption is going to, is going to increase. And this parameter alpha that I have here, which again, this has been confirmed empirically, it's the notion of the energy efficiency of the consumer appliance or how energy efficient my dwelling is in terms of do I have like energy efficient windows and so on. So that essentially dictates how much consumption I should expect for a given outdoor temperature and a given indoor thermostat setting. Okay, now, if I'm a consumer, if I'm a typical consumer, I have an ideal temperature. Let's say my ideal temperature is theta. I want to set my indoor temperature at theta. Ideally, that's what the level of the temperature that gives me the maximum comfort or the maximum pressure. So not pressure, pleasure, maximum pleasure. So then what is the utility that I have? So the utility that I have is beta zero. Beta zero is the maximum utility that I can enjoy. But as the indoor temperature setting X deviates from my ideal, which is theta, I incur some discomfort, which is represented by this beta term. So beta represents my sensitivity to deviation from my ideal temperature. So if my ideal temperature is 72 degrees, but I set my indoor setting at 70, for example, then the di difference is two degrees. And then that gives me some discomfort from the maximum pleasure that I can get, which is beta zero. So if electricity was free, what would I do? I would definitely set X equal to theta. I just set my indoor temperature to my ideal level. There is no reason for me to deviate. But the point is that electricity is not free. Or alternatively, one can say, or I have, I'm environmentally conscious, so I don't really want to set my indoor temperature necessarily equal to outdoor temperature, especially set to my ideal temperature, especially when I see that outdoor is too hot or too cold. So I want to save a little bit. Now we can account for that by, of course, penalizing for the amount of money that I have to pay per my consumption. And my overall utility therefore is the pleasure or the comfort that I get minus the price that I have to pay multiplied by the total quantity that I consume. So this, this function together uh, overall represents the overall consumer utility that, I, that, that, that is faced by a typical consumer. And then, okay, now it, consider a very naive setting. Let's assume that we are always rational and we are always available to just readjust our AC temperature at any point in time. We call it a perfectly responsive consumer, which is far, far from reality. But for the sake of argument, look for now, let's assume we have a perfectly responsive consumer. Then obviously that perfectly responsive consumer wants to optimize this utility function. So therefore, and what is the decision variable? The decision variable is X. X is my thermostat setting. I want to find the optimal thermostat setting, which maximizes my utility. And this is a very easy problem. And this is the optimal solution. The optimal solution is a linear combination of theta, my ideal temperature, and W, the outdoor temperature, at any point in time. So basically, you see that the weight is represented by this ratio, which is increasing in price. So as price increases, I give more weight to outdoor temperature and less weight to my ideal temperature, which is, which is very obvious. So as electricity becomes more expensive, I let my indoor to be closer to outdoor. On the other hand, as electricity becomes cheaper, I really don't care about outdoor anymore. I just make my indoor setting closer and closer to my ideal. So this is very obvious, that's what you expect. And then as W changes, let's say from 
this hour to the next hour, I readjust my X star again. I, re I readjust my thermostat setting and get the, the, a new uh, optimal temperature. So this is what happens in an ideal world where customers are perf perfectly responsive and there's no limited cognitive uh, ability or there's no um, behavioral barrier for customers to readjust. But in reality, as I said, that's not the case. So now let's go to a more realistic setting. And that's exactly the purpose of this talk, how consumers in reality make decisions. So our goal here is to propose some theoretical framework that captures consumer behavior at an aggregate level. And for that, we are going to use a notion called rational inattention, which has been developed in economic literature over the last, last, last couple of decades and is gaining more and more attention. So what does this rational inattention mean? Rational inattention argues that even in situations where a decision maker has access to all possible options and all information needed to make the optimal decision, the decision maker does not necessarily optimize its decision frequent, her decision frequently because, as I said, there is some cost associated with re-optimizing the decision. So now we want to use this notion into our decision making for a, a household to see how that affects their optimal thermostat setting, for example. So in this setting, we say consumer decisions essentially can be represented as a random variable X, and I will make that more clear. So let's say W, capital W, is the external random shock or like the outdoor temperature, which can be presented using a random variable with a given mean mu and a standard deviation sigma. And in the literature, it has been shown that normal distribution would be a very good representation of, of outdoor temperature. So let's say W is outdoor temperature, which follows a normal random variable. And then X is my decision which again is captured using a random variable. What does it mean? It means that my decision can be represented as a, as a, as a, decision, as a decision rule, which is a mapping from the realization of W to a conditional distribution. So in other words, unlike the perfectly responsible, responsive case in which once W is realized, there is a corresponding optimal X. Here we say once W is realized, we have a distribution over X. We have a conditional distribution, which determines how I react to X. Meaning that if W happens to be, let's say 40 degrees, with some probability, my indoor setting is gonna be 70, with some probability it's gonna be 75, with some probability it's gonna be 80 and so on. So I don't have a singleton anymore. I have a distribution, which represents my behavior, represents my decision route. And this, is particu this particularly makes sense when we are facing a collection of households. So maybe each household has a simpler decision role, but at an aggregate level, when we put them all together, their collective decision rule can be represented using a random variable. And then the question is, what is this conditional probability? How this conditional probability can be, can be determined? And under the notion of rational inattention, when we know this conditional probability, we can infer how much information should be processed by the consumer in order to make that particular decision. So let's say, as I said, if the distribution G corresponds to outdoor temperature, W, which for example, can be normal, then this term, which is referred to as Shannon mutual information, for those of you who are familiar with information theory, those of you who are from computer science, you have a, a computer science background, probably you are familiar with this notion of mutual information, Shannon's mutual information. So this uh, quantity represents how much information I have, to, I have to process if the conditional distribution is given by F. So the higher this value is, it means that I'm more active. I'm reacting more, I'm more responsive. Uh, I, I'm more responsive to W. On the other hand, if this quantity is small, it means that I really don't care much about W. So but in other words, this quantity measures the amount of information inherent in X corresponding to W. So the closer these two are, which means I'm more active to, I, I'm more reactive to W, th then this quantity is gonna be higher. So then I can re recast the consumer decision problem as maximization over this conditional distribution so what would, be, what would be a typical co consumer do? So again, as before, 
a typical consumer would try to maximize her expected utility, the same that we had before, minus some cost of processing information. So this term is added to the consumer problem to capture that cognitive limitation, to capture the fact that we are not willing to always optimize our thermostat setting or optimize we optimize our consumption decision as the as our ambient environment changes or if there is new shock to our demand pattern. So this is exactly the core. This is what is going to make the difference. So this parameter lambda can be represented as the marginal cost of processing information. In other words, the higher the lambda, the more difficult it is for me, or there's a, more, there's a higher opportunity cost for me to readjust my decision. Now, this is exactly the link to a smart, me, to a smart technologies. So ideally, a smart technologies are meant to reduce this parameter to make it easier for us. Maybe if we can pre-program our thermostat or our other uh, smart appliances, then this uh, re-optimization can happen in the background without us actively getting involved. And as a result, incurring this processing cost or incurring this uh, opportunity cost. So that is the parameter that should be incorporated into decision-making and into the design of demand response programs. And presumably the idea is that as more and more people start to use smart appliances, programmable appliances, this cost of processing information is gonna be reduced. But again, if you look at the entire market, let's say there is a Lambda hat associated with the entire market, which is captured using a representative household, and then that representative household has to solve this optimization problem. So that's the idea. And the optimal solution to that is a FSR, this conditional property, which is, as I said, is a decision rule which tells us for any realization of W, what is the conditional distribution for my action X? And then correspondingly, what is the, uh, what is the decision, what is the random variable representing the consumer's decision as a function of price P, okay? So luckily we are able to, so let me skip that for a moment and get back to the data. So luckily we are able to fully characterize the optimal solution of the consumer in the presence of this competitive limitation. So, let me remind you of the perfectly response, uh, responsive case. This was the optimal solution when essentially lambda is zero. I can re-optimize at any moment. I observe W, I, I readjust my optimal decision. Again, five minutes later, I again observe a different W, I adjust my decision again. But what happens in the presence of lambda? In the presence of lambda, which is, represents our cost of processing information, the consumer setting for the appliance, X star, and the random variable W, which represents the ambient environment, follows a jointly normal distribution with given a correlation coefficient, as you can see here. And this is going to be the mean of my setting, and this is going to be the standard deviation. So what does it all mean? First of all, if you look at the mean, it resembles what we had above, except that W is replaced by mu. So on average, my thermostat setting is essentially the same as before on average, but now I have some fluctuation. So here, essentially the variance of X is the same as the variance of W because for any W I have a new X and correlation is one. But here, as you can see, if Lambda is too high, this, co the, uh, this correlation is going to be zero. Meaning that if if consumers have a high cost of processing information, they completely become non-responsive to what's, what's happening in the ambient environment. So that's probably the case for some of us. If, for example, we really value our time or we really do not want to incorporate this, what's going, what is happening outside into our decision-making, so that probably that means that, well, our, our, uh, our uh, correlation coefficient is essentially zero. But on the other hand, as lambda decreases, correlation between my decision and what is happening in the, out, in, in the uh, ambient environment increases and becomes, becomes larger. So, okay, what does it tell us? So I, I told you, I showed you before like three different apartments from New York City and their behavior in terms of outdoor temperature versus, versus outdoor. So this is the aggregate for a few, I think they, 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 are, uh, they are about like 100 apartments. So this is the aggregate level of their consumption decision. You can see that the random variable, variable representing their, their decision, that random variable X that I talked about before, and this is the random variable W. And as you can see, 
there is a correlation coefficient of 0.18. So if I'm a utility company, this is really important. It matters that how the indoor setting varies in response to outdoor temperature, because obviously that has significant, significant implications on how the overall consumption of electricity is going to be, is going to unfold over time. Okay, so what is the effect of price? The effect of price is relatively obvious here. For any given uh, lambda, what it can be shown is that for any given price, as electricity becomes more and more expensive, the consumer decision gets closer, big, sorry, becomes less expensive as price decreases. The consumer decision becomes closer to theta, the ideal level, that, that is my ideal temperature, and it becomes less valuable and less correlated with W, which makes sense. If electricity is cheap, I really don't care much about W, there is less correlation between my, my decision and outdoor temperature. But on the other hand, as P increases and X becomes more expensive, I become more responsive. I deviate more from theta, my ideal temperature, and my decision becomes more and more correlated with W. In particular, if electricity is very cheap, meaning that below a certain threshold represented by P hat, then I become fully non-responsive, which means that what's happening in my ambient environment really does not influence my, my overall decision, okay? So now on the other hand, what is the effect of lambda? As I said, presumably lambda can be a measure of the level of uh, uh, basically how much, how or what fraction of consumers incorporate smart appliances into their, in, for example, into their house. And uh, as a result, it lowers the cost of processing information or cognitive attention that they have to pay to readjust their consumption decision. So as you can see, as Lambda increases, essentially, uh, even though the consumer decision remains insensitive to, to uh, Lambda on average, but it becomes less variable and less correlated with Ws. And that's, that's exactly, sorry, that's exactly what is expected to happen here. So essentially, if the cost of processing information is too high, you really don't act. You, you are not really responsive. But if lambda decreases, then it's not really costly for you to readjust your decision. And as a result, you become more responsive and you lower, for example, maybe you lower your thermostat setting when outside is too cold, or you increase your thermostat setting by a few degrees when you realize that outside is too high in order to save electricity or in order to essentially help, help the environment. So now what is the implication of this for the utility firm? Uh, let me skip this in the interest of time and get to the bottom of it. Because at the end of the day, if you're a utility firm, what you care about is the overall consumption quantity, okay? Now that we know how the consumers make decision in the presence of this cognitive limitation, what is its implication on the overall consumption that the utility firm is facing? In effect, what we are doing here, it allows us to fully characterize in close form the stochastic demand curve, which is being faced by the utility firm. So we can show that the overall consumption quantity faced by the utility firm follows a non-central non chi-square distribution. And we can fully characterize its mean and its variance. Uh, and well, OK, without uh, like paying too much attention to this like complicated mathematical equation, what does it mean? Well, it means that as price increases, OK, consumption quantity decreases on average. That's expected, more expensive electricity, less consumption. And also as Lambda increases, consumption on average increases, which is a bad thing. Again, as cost of process information is higher, we know that consumers consume more on average. How about variance? Interestingly, same is true about the variance, meaning that as price increases, the variance in the consumer's behavior, which leads to the, the variability in the total consumption faced by a utility firm is also decreasing. And similarly, if you have, uh, if, if the cost of processing information is, is higher, which means that if Lambda increases, we see that there is more variability in what the utility firm should observe in the total consumption. So in other words, we see the dual role played by both price and Lambda in regulating demand, not only higher price or a lower, not only a higher price or a lower lambda leads to less consumption, which is, which is preferred. It also leads to less valuable consumption, which obviously has a huge impact 
on reliability of the of our electrical grid, meaning that the, the possibility of facing blackout and brownout is also it is also um, governed by the value of p and value of lambda. So in other words, if you are a utility firm, you take this into account and you can fully characterize what is the stochastic demand curve that you are facing and not only how the expected demand changes with respect to p and lambda but also how the variability of demand also reacts to these changes in p and lambda and i realize that i have only a couple of minutes to wrap up so the, so therefore I, I do not have time to go over the rest of uh, of our derivations in terms of well if you are a utility firm how you should incorporate this into finding you or, in, or into setting your optimal price. But I, the only thing that I want to mention, so let, this is the uh, utility firm's optimization problem, which, which I'm gonna skip. But the bottom line is that if you're a utility firm, and as I said, you are facing this population of consumers which have a limited cognitive ability or face a cost of processing information, when you want to set your price, well, it, we can essentially picture it in this two dimensional graph on the horizontal line, we have lambda, which represents cost of processing information. And as I said, it's a kind of a rough measure of like the level of a smart appliances, which is being incorporated into the consumer population. And then in the left, on the horizontal line, on the vertical line, we have this parameter kappa, which is kind of a notion of the weather. So my ideal temperature minus the average temperature divided by, divided by variance. And for different seasons and different geographical areas, obviously this quantity is gonna be different. So we can see that in fact, under the firm's optimal pricing, what's gonna happen is that there are these tr two thresholds on this uh, parameter lambda so that if we are between these two thresholds, it is optimal for the firm to set price in a way that it induces no response from the consumers. On the other hand, once we are outside this region, the firm has to set its optimal price in a way that it induces more responsive behavior from the customers. So, and then what happens if there is, as all of, all of us know, obviously firms do not have full freedom in setting their optimal price because uh, they are, especially in the regulated markets, they are uh, regulated by public utility commissions which set an upper bound on the, amount, on the price that they can set. So if you have an upper bound on price, that can potentially introduce this new region in this two-dimensional graph, which again, in this region, the, opt the, uh, the price is so that the consumers are non-responsive to changes in the ambient environment under the optimal price. So now what if we have an additional restriction for reliability of the system, which means that you want to make sure that the variability or the variance in overall consumption is below a threshold so that the probability of facing a blackout or brownout is a smaller than a very small epsilon, let's say one over thousand. So if you have this reliability constraint, the results are pretty much similar. The only difference is that this non-responsive region shrinks. So if you remember from the previous slide, in the previous slide, this non-responsive region was represented using this U-shaped region. Now it becomes smaller in the presence of a reliability constraint. So with that, let me just wrap up by summarizing essentially what we have done here. So the, the, the main goal of this research is to provide a unified framework for analyzing households electricity consumption decision. And uh, this is a kind of an alternative and more informed explanation for some of the inelasticities that we observe in practice as uh, in, in, in response to variations in price or variations in, in, in weather. And this provides a kind of a building block for let's say utility firms or policymakers to come up with uh, better demand response programs, design more effective demand response programs because it allows them to better predict the consumer's behavior and what kind of a statistical pattern we should expect for any given price, what kind of a statistical patterns we should expect from the consumer population and the dual role which is played by price, not only in reducing the average consumption, but also in regulating the variation in, in consumption, which obviously plays a role in reliability of, of, the, of the electrical grid. So with that, I think I'm already two minutes over time. 
Uh, let me stop here. The only thing that I want to mention is that actually luckily recently we have also obtained some data from one of the producers of one of the manufacturers of smart thermostats. And it's a very rich data set. And now we are using that data to empirically test the validity of this theoretical framework that we have developed here and see what is the estimated parameter lambda that I just presented here? What is the estimated parameter lambda for different customer population, let's say in different cities or in different regions, and how that can be used in order to come up with some recommendations for uh, better pricing decisions uh, for policymakers and utility firms. So that's all I have to say. And uh, thanks for your attention. With that, I'm going to stop and happy to happy to hear any comments or any questions that you might have. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I, I see that there is one question. Uh, the question is, uh, does the smart, will this smart technology be able to reduce lambda to zero? So if I, if I understand the question, so the question was, does smart technologies will be able to reduce lambda? Is that the question? Lambda, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, yeah that's exactly the idea. Because again, what does, at, a, at an aggregate level, what does lambda represent? Lambda is a measure of, well, how hard it is for me to react to changes in the demand, changes in, the, in my ambient environment. Now, if you have a smart appliances, which can be pre-programmed, then, for example, I do not need to actively engage in making those kind of decisions or readjusting my different thermostat setting, for example, my water heater. I don't need to like constantly check the outdoor temperature, let's say every hour or every two hours or every five hours. And then if I say, okay, this is a very cold night or this is a very hot summer afternoon. And as a result, I want to readjust my decision. All of them can be pre-programmed into a, a smart appliances and they can automatically implement that those decisions for me without me actively implement, get actively trying to re-optimize. And uh, as a result, this lambda potentially becomes much smaller. And then uh, the, the, uh, our goal is to see, okay, now how smaller lambda can help uh, utility firms and how system operators to uh, essentially lower overall consumption and variability in consumption and improve reliability of the power grid. I don't know if that answer answered the question. If there is a follow-up question, you can unmute yourself to ask the question. Are there any other questions? Yes, there's. Uh, okay. Are there programs that are focusing on trying to reduce lambda already? That's the question. Are there programs that are focusing on trying to reduce lambda? So, uh, to some extent, yes. For example, I mentioned some of these apartments in New York City. I was presenting this paper at Georgia Tech and one of the faculty there told me that, especially for some of these underprivileged neighborhoods, th there are some, some of these nonprofit uh, organizations which try to nudge customers, for example, based on what's happening, for example, with outdoor temperature. They try to send text messages to, consumer, to customers, for example, to say, this is, a, this is a good time for you to, let's say, if it's a it's a hot summer afternoon to lower your thermostat setting by a couple of degrees and that helps you to save significantly on your electricity bill or exa for example or that really helps us to improve the reliability of the grid so these kind of actions yes they are already on the way especially for people who are very sensitive to their electricity bill which probably does not include people like us but there are people who are really sensitive to electricity bill and or in Europe, for example, where electricity is much more expensive than here, people indeed react to what's happening outdoor. But mm -hmm. now in terms of, again, in, in terms of responding to the question, before we get into a, uh, hopefully at some point we get to a level where there are more and more smart appliances and lambda is significantly reduced. What is happening right now, as I said, is to nudge customers or actively provide them with the kind of information that they need so that maybe hopefully they can incorporate those and 
potentially that can lead them to readjust their decision. So because Lambda is the overall captures two things, it costs of acquiring and processing information. So at least this kind of nudging systems using, let's say using text messages, that helps the customers for the acquiring part. At least they don't need to acquire, they, know, they don't need to think about it. Now, if, if I receive a text message, then I know that, okay, it's a good time for me to react to it. And for, for example, change my thermostat setting to save on my electricity bill or help the, help the power grid. Uh, so that is some of the kind of a ad hoc measures that are, that are happening already. But again, overall, I assume that the best solution to, to um, achieve lower lambda is incorporation of a smart technologies as is already happening in, 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 in some parts. By the way, there is a follow-up question to the first question. Uh, will lambda ever be reduced to zero? Well, may, maybe not necessarily to zero, but again, the question is, uh, the, the point is that the more, the smaller lambda is, so obviously it has implications on the firm's optimal pricing, but overall it also reduces the overall variation that we see in, 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 in the consumption. Basically, it would make it much easier for us to predict demand. So whether it's reduced to zero or not, it, it, it depends whether we ever get to a point that we have a smart appliances, which can, again, as I said, be pre-programmed fully to the extent that they react to what's happening outside. But it's not only the presence of a smart appliances, it's also how we use them in the sense that, let's say if I really don't, really don't want, if I'm completely insensitive to price and I only care about my comfort, and I really don't care about the environment, then incorporation of a smart appliances is not going to really help. At the end of the day, the only thing that the smart appliances are going to do is to empower me to lower my lambda. But then again, it's a trade-off between my comfort, between my price sensitivity, and this cost of processing information. If I really put a high weight on my comfort and I put a very small weight on price sensitivity, which meaning that I'm not really price sensitive or, not, or I'm not really environmentally conscious, then no matter how uh, environmentally, how, no, no matter how uh, smart my appliances are, if I don't use that toward, uh, toward that goal, then obviously uh, Lambda is not gonna reduce. But an aggregate level, I can imagine that, as I said, um, with more incorporation of a smart appliances, I, 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 I expect, expect the magnitude of this parameter to to, to decrease over time. Any other comments or? Yeah, any other questions? Yeah, there's one. Uh, what do you mean by price of information processing? To the best of my knowledge, Lambda has to reflect the cost of power delivery at the location of the customer. Does the information processing a new term on the price? Oh, no, 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 Lambda is not price. So in my notation, in my formulation, so if, if I go back to the consumer optimization problem, uh, so essentially Lambda is the, let's call it inconvenience or the cost that I incur if I want to readjust my decision. So, so this, is, this is exactly what Lambda represents. So on the one hand, I want to maximize my expected utility, which is my comfort from which is the comfort that I get from my temperature setting minus the price that I have to pay for the electricity that I consume. But there is a third part which represents the, the hassle or the uh, opportunity cost that I have to incur to re-optimize my decision or readjust my consumption decision. So that's what Lambda represents. So again, the more closely this X and W are, X being the random variable which represents my action, W being the random variable which represents my ambient environment. The more closely these two are tied together, it means that I'm really responsive, meaning that my X is much more dependent on W. Okay, that means that I'm really responsive. I'm processing a lot of information to readjust my consumption decision in response to W. Okay, as a result, I'm, pro I'm processing more information. So Lambda is the unit cost of processing information. So what is this overall information that is being processed for two random variables, X and W? That is what I presented here using the Shannon's mutual information. So 
we have to measure how closely tied these two distributions are. And the higher this value is, it means that I really care a lot about W. I'm really responsive to W. On the other hand, if it's really small, it means that I ignore W. This can be as low as zero, which means I completely disregard W when I set my X. That means that I'm a non-responsive consumer. And the other extreme is when this is really high, which means that, well, I'm a very responsive consumer. When I observe W, I readjust my X. And then obviously all those readjustments are costly from the cognitive perspective, and I have to penalize for that. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. I'm penalizing for the fact that I'm re-optimizing my decisions over time. And that is, that is captured uh, using this parameter lambda. Okay, if, does that answer the question? Just answer it, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, there is uh, a follow-up question. What is yes. the typical meaning of W? Okay, so very good. So again, in the context of this talk, overall W is any random shock which influences my demand. Okay, here to set, to fix the idea, I use W as random variable representing, let's say, for example, output temperature. Okay, so meaning that because think about it, if you set your thermostat setting, let's say at 72, how much your AC is gonna consume depends on, depends on how cold or how hot outdoor is. And that's gonna fluctuate. Let's say I can keep my indoor setting at 72 for the entire season, so let's say for the entire winter, but how much I consume during each, let's say hour, obviously depends on outdoor temperature. So as outdoor temperature fluctuates, which is a random variable, the amount of consumption, even though my X is constant, the amount of consumption varies. So then the question is, do I react to that or, or, or I don't? And yeah, again, in response to a question, the physical meaning of W in the context of what, the model that I presented today is let's say outdoor temperature. It's just a random variable which represents how cold or how hot uh, outdoor is. And then uh, obviously because that has an obvious implication on, on my overall consumption. Uh, there is a can... new message. Uh, yes. Uh, how do you incorporate decision making frequency or interval, uh, like second, minute, or hour to set a fab lambda? Okay. If I understand the question correctly, how do you incorporate decision making frequency or interval? So remember, mm -hmm. here I'm capturing a population of households. You are right. You are saying that if it's an individual household, individual households are not like, they are not like, Observing the optimal, observing the outdoor temperature, and then say, they say, "Okay, now I'm using this conditional probability distribution to set to to de de determine what is going to be my indoor setting." Of, of course, that's not how we make our decision. For example, we say maybe every five hour, or maybe every day, or every half a day, we set our AC setting. So I, I assume that's exactly what you mean by interval, meaning that we have a decision rule that we follow. Maybe in the morning when we leave the house we set our AC to some level. And then when we come back, we readjust it to another level. And then when we go to sleep, maybe we change it to another level and so on. So I assume that's what you mean by interval. But the argument here is that when we are facing a population of customers, okay, it is as if this aggregate level decision follows this conditional distribution. So again, this is not to say that this is how in, in reality consumers make decision, but it says the consumer decision making can be made, it can, can be represented or can be framed using this framework at an aggregate level. Okay, so you have your own interval or you have your own decision rule in terms of how you set your AC. I have my own, let's say Chinu has, has his own. And then, but at aggregate level, when we look at the entire market, entire population, it is as if, there is this conditional probability distribution which gover governs the, the overall uh, decision, the, the overall consumption decision that this representative consumer makes. So that's the idea here. Okay. Any more questions?
I, I have one question. Yeah. I, uh, when you say upgrade, are you looking at a, a feeder level or? So, so when, when, I, when, you, when you say what? When I, you say aggregate, when you aggregate the consumers, yeah. are you looking at a feeder level? And so aggregate, what I mean is, a, yeah, is a, let's say a zip code. It depends on, okay, what population a utility firm is facing like mm -hmm. in, in terms of the, the aggregate demand function. So let's say I'm serving, I'm, provide, I'm supplying electricity to, to a region or to a city, okay? And the question is, on a, on a hot summer afternoon, what should I expect? What kind of consumption pattern, statistically, what kind of consumption pattern I should expect from this population of households? Mm -hmm. So this framework is a, is a kind of aggregate, is a way, way of capturing that overall consumption at an aggregate level, if that makes sense. Well, I, I, I know you are running this every 15 minutes or so, you know, because the problem itself is static. It's a static problem, but, but you, yeah, you exactly. run it every 15 minutes. So if you make it more dynamic, capturing the dynamics of the of the network, right. because the network will tell you exactly or roughly how often you should run these optimization problems. So, so the idea, you're, you're right. Maybe I should have mentioned that in terms of okay, what is the time frame in this in this optimization problem? Obviously, we can we can it's it's up to us in terms of how we want to set the time horizon. But let's say the time horizon is a block of time during which it is safe to assume that, let's say, for example, outdoor temperature follows this normal distribution, okay? So let's say my time frame is from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. I know that between 2 p.m. and 7 p.m., this normal distribution is a good estimation or good approximation for my outdoor temperature. And then the question is, during this five hour block, what is going to be the distribution of X which, which dictates the distribution of consumption quantity. So if I run this optimization problem and the fo follow up consumption quantity problem that I, I, I showed you in, in, in subsequent slides, that tells me that look, during this five hour time block, this is the, the probability distribution of your total consumption. So of course, as you, as you say, the, the, the total consumption varies by moment but mm -hmm. the answer to this question gives me the distribution of that, uh, that gives me the statistical pattern or the distribution of total consumption over this time block, over this, let's say, five hour time block. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Do we have any more questions? Okay, so uh, Professor Ali Samias, thank you for the presentation.